All right, let's pray um, and never give up. That's today's sermon title. And uh, that's the message, just to give you the thesis statement for today's sermon. Pray and never give up. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful church, your church, Church for the Nations. Help us continue to be a church that prays for each other, builds each other up, and never gives up. Lord, I pray uh, that this, these words that are about to be proclaimed, let them be an offertory of exaltation to encourage your church, to lift us up to you, and for us to be encouraged, full of courage, full of faith, full of grace and truth. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So at Church for the Nations, we honor the word of God, and we do that by reading the scriptures together. So if you're able, please stand, and we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke. We're continuing our series through the parables of Jesus uh, up until Easter and Palm Sunday. So with that said, let us read the eight verses together. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what, God, what, what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on the earth? The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, I don't have to set my phone alarm anymore because this little guy, my son, my youngest son, wakes me up at 6 a.m. Today he woke me up at 7 a.m. Yeah, so it's good. It's been good. So he comes up to my bed. He says the word up and then starts hitting me on the head and goes, baba, 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 yes, baba, okay. And then I wake up. And sometimes prayer could feel like that. We are like, dad, 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 are you there? Are you listening? Are you up? Are you aware with what's happening? Wake up, God, where are you? He's there, he's just, you know, taking it easy. <laughs> prayer is like that. Two nights ago, my older son, he's three and a half, uh, we pray together before we sleep. We read the Bible. Uh, N.T. Wright, uh, someone who Pastor Jim and I quote a lot, but biblical scholar, just released the children's Bible. Uh, so we've been reading that together. And then we, we pray. And he told me, I don't want to pray anymore. I said, why don't you want to pray anymore? He goes, I don't have any more feelings left. So I was like, son, you know what? I'm going to teach you a prayer that my dad taught me and that his dad taught him and that his dad taught him. And for thousands of years, this prayer has been passed down for one dad to the next. And I'm going to teach it to you today. And he got really excited. He didn't feel like praying, but then he learned the Lord's Prayer for the first time. So he said to our father, he prayed it. Even though he didn't feel like praying, he prayed it. And then I would talk to him about how prayer is like talking to a parent. It's like talking to your dad, but you're talking to your perfect father in heaven. As my dad would always tell me, look, I am a flawed father, but your father in heaven is perfect, and he loves you. And that's the message we have. We have a God we pray to who loves us perfectly, and we get to talk to him. And to talk to him, we need to be adopted first and foremost into his family. Everyone here is made in the image of God, but not everyone is a son and daughter of God until they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord. In that moment, you receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you get adopted into the family called the church, God's family, where Jesus' dad becomes your dad, where you're changed from the inward out. 
as Romans says, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, the Baba. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are indeed God's children. And what a beautiful reality we live in when the maker of heaven and earth made us and wants us to be part of his family. So the widow and the unjust judge. judge. So she faced this injustice. You remember, 2,000 years ago, she couldn't like, pick up the phone and dial 911. There was no detective coming to her door, looking for forensic evidence, trying to solve the case. She had to bring her case before a judge. And the judge was very dismissive. He didn't care about people. He didn't fear God. He was his own little world. He was just doing his job, maybe callous, maybe just kind of a stoic individual, didn't want to use empathy in his job, just was dismissive, as the scripture says. And maybe you've dealt with someone like that in the past. You know, someone just doing their job, they're, they're, they're not warm, they don't really care. This judge was like that. And this widow, we don't know what her injustice was. Maybe she lost her husband. Maybe he was murdered. Maybe something bad happened to him. Jesus keeps it vague on purpose because there's so many injustices in this world. There's so many things that we're longing to be made right when they're not. And this widow is experiencing the hardship of hardship. The Bible says pure religion is taking care of widows and orphans because widows and orphans can't give you anything back in return, especially back then 2,000 years ago. You were in an awful situation if you were a widow or an orphan. And pure religion is taking care of them. Loving people who can't give you anything in return. There's no networking opportunity. You're just loving and sacrificing for the other because that's what our faith is about, loving people. And this widow who's going through a hardship is demanding justice, and she's not getting it. So what does she do? Does she give up? No. Luke says the parable is about not giving up and praying. She was persistent in her prayers, persistent in her resolve. She didn't lose heart. That's actually the Greek translation. She did not lose heart. As we sang is the first song uh, today. She did not lose heart. She did not give up. She was persistent, and she kept knocking on the judge, this is his door, and said, give me my justice. This needs to be right. This wrong needs to be uh, vindicated. There needs to be something done about this great injustice that I faced. And Jesus is telling us, look, if we go to our Father, who's not a callous, stoic God, but a loving Father, if we're going to Him with our prayers, Him with our persistence, you don't think He's ultimately going to right the wrongs eventually? We need to learn this lesson to never give up, and to continue to pray to our Father who lives in heaven, because he alone will bring about the justice. He alone will answer the prayers. He alone will make this world to rights. We worship a God who loves us, and we need to worship him by pursuing him and being persistent like this widow, demanding justice, demanding the, the world to be made right. And in that, we pray that prayer, thy will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's reign to be here on earth, because it's not. That's why there's injustices. That's why there's so much sin and, and deceit and, and hurting everywhere we look. But if we are persistent, God, come through, intervene, bring heaven to earth, then we get part, we become part of God's plan to redeem this fallen and broken world. And we do it with his help. We do it as a family belonging to him, with Jesus, our big brother, as our example, with the Holy Spirit residing in with us. So it's no longer just doing things for God, it's doing things with God, the Holy Spirit, being obedient to the commands of God, our Heavenly Father, knowing that we are forgiven and loved because of Jesus Christ's ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So let's pray without ceasing. As 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 18 says, don't stop praying. It's the abridged version. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances even when you don't have any feelings left. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
pray without ceasing. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Protestant Reformation, said, when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling overwhelmed, what do you need to do? Pray and let God worry about it. Just pray. Let God do the worrying for you. C.S. Lewis has this great quote about prayer. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I am helpless. It doesn't change God, it changes me. And if you understand prayer, it's not about changing the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's allowing the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever change us so we can become more and more like his children. Prayer changes us. Prayers don't change God. That's pagan prayer. We're Christians. We submit to the Father's will. We want the Father's will because only when the Father's will happens, you have truth and justice. Hemel K. says this in his prayers, Use me, God. Show me how to take who I am, who I want to be, and what I can do, and use it for, the purpose, for a purpose greater than myself. There is prayer power. We need to be praying constantly. To be a Christian is to pray. Because if we don't pray, that means we're not connecting to the living God, and we think we could just do it by ourselves. The parable says, pray and be persistent. Pray and don't give up. About 12 years ago now, I ran the Philadelphia Marathon. And uh, the first time I ran a half marathon, I ran because there was a girl I kind of had a crush on, and I just wanted to find something common. It didn't work out, thank God, looking back. Um, and then the next time I ran a half marathon was, I was like, you know what, I'm going to not do this for those other reasons. I'm going to do it because I want to love God. So I've listened to worship music and Christian books while on my training, and it was good. It was joyful because I was running with God. And then the third time, after I ran my half marathons, I built up to the marathon. I'm like, you know what? I think God wants to use this training exercise of mine for something greater. So I actually raised money to help Syrian refugees at the time because it was the beginning of that Syrian civil war. And I ran for a cause. And there was something beautiful about running for a cause. And I allowed God in the process of the training to get to the goal of helping other people. It became worship sessions. It became a Christian edification. My runs would become opportunities to pray to God and connect to God. However, the day of the marathon, I hit the runner's wall when your body just shuts down. Two miles before the 20, what was it, 26.1 miles? Yeah, before that 26.2 miles, I had two more miles to go, and my body just shut down. I was barely able to move. I was running, but I was running slower than I was walking. And I was just praying to God, help me get through this. Help me not give up. I'm helping other people. Just help me get through this. And it was the longest two miles of my life. But thanks be to God, he got me through. I didn't give up. I finished the race, raised some money to help some refugees, and uh, I could say I ran a marathon. Marathons are weird because, like, the first person to run a marathon died. You guys know the story of the marathon? (laughs) All right, so uh, it was a war. (laughs) It was called the Battle of Marathon. And I think it was the Athenians battling some other guys, and they won. So a guy's battling uh, all day long in in this vicious battle, And then he wants to tell the good news that they are victorious to the king because there's no cell phones back then. They they had to deliver things by word of mouth. So he runs the distance from Marathon to Athens. He gets to the king and says, Niniki, amen. We are victorious. Then he drops dead. And everyone's like, that's a good idea. Let's just run 25 miles. And then it was the, I think it was the Olympics in England where they miscalculated the 25 miles and actually the 26.2 miles. So now everyone runs an extra mile, 0.2, because of that miscalculation. But if you think about the Christian journey, it's a good analogy. We are victorious as Christians. And one day we're going to get to our king and we're going to say we are victorious because he won the battle for us. And in this journey of life, There's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be challenges. But we have to be speaking from our lips those Greek words, 
And in the key, amen. We are victorious. Let's pray and not give up. Anyone seen Braveheart? Yeah. All right. It's actually really poorly historic. It's not as historic as, as I wished it was. However, it was, it's a great movie. And uh, the Braveheart is actually not Mel Gibson's character, William Wallace, but Robert the Bruce, the king. Historically, he's called Braveheart. And in the movie, it doesn't necessarily say William Wallace is uh, the Braveheart, but actually Robert the Bruce, who in the pivotal moment of the movie, another spoiler alert, it's been like 30 years, come on, you have to see it by now. Um, he betrays William Wallace and the, 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 the rebellion against the England. England. And he tells his dad after portraying uh, this figure, I don't want to lose heart. And then the dad says, no, everyone eventually has to compromise. I don't want to lose heart. Eventually, after William Wallace's sacrifice, Robert de Bruce leads, which is historically accurate, he's the one who leads Scotland to its independence. He's the brave heart. He didn't want to lose heart, even though he compromised and sold his soul. Uh, when the Greek word is being used here, pray and don't quit, it's saying don't lose heart. Those are, that's the exact phrase. Do not lose your heart. Do not lose your courage. Do not lose it. But pray and keep your integrity. Pray and be bold. Pray, stand firm, and keep going. Like the persistent widow. We're going to pivot from Braveheart to professional wrestling. Okay, some fans, like all three of you, it's good. Uh, so this is one of the most famous uh, wrestlers, John Cena. Uh, he's a movie star uh, now. And his motto was never give up. And he took that motto and became Make-A-Wish Foundation's number one requested visitor. And he visited uh, 650 kids with, with terminal illnesses. With that message, don't give up. It's really powerful. Don't give up. We want to be people who don't give up and pray. You know the difference between a black belt and a white belt? Not much. A black belt is what? A white belt who never gave up. That's what a, a black belt is. What's the hardest belt to get? The white belt, because you can't get the black belt unless you start. Don't give up. Let us pray. Um, so this context of this parable is in the sense of seeking justice in the, in the here and the now. And before I was called into ministry, or actually during the time I was called into ministry, I was a political uh, science undergrad. I actually lived in D.C. for four years, studied government, worked on Capitol Hill. And my cause that I fought for was making sure America, the United States, where I'm a citizen, acknowledged the Armenian genocide that took place in 1915. 1.5 million Armenians were systematically annihilated, uprooted from their lands, and that's why Armenians are scattered all over the world. Um, and sadly, America did not recognize it as genocide. They're political allies with Turkey. Turkey still doesn't recognize it. But this was my issue. This is my home in America. They have to be the ones who I call it for what it is, because history repeats if you don't condemn atrocities. Uh, Hitler himself said, who remembers the plight of the Armenians after he invaded Poland and then used the template that the Turks used for the Armenians to do the Holocaust? We have to call in justice, see it, and condemn it so it doesn't repeat. And sadly, it keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. Moral of the story is this was my social justice cause. And uh, three years ago, the House, the Senate, and the President all acknowledged it as genocide. I lobbied on Capitol Hill. I did a lot of social media campaigns. Well, I have a lot of stories from it. One time I preached in Times Square, and it was like the closest thing I had to a viral video content, uh, just calling out Turkey to acknowledge genocide. And it's still not, the work's still not done because of what we talked about last week when we had uh, the issue of Artsakh mentioned by our guest. Uh, and the perpetrators of the crime still don't accept that they committed genocide. What is your cause that you're crying out to God? 
where is the justice? Where is the truth? And as Christians, we should care about justice. We should care about truth. We should care about people who are hurting because God cares about them. And if the church doesn't wake up to these issues, we just become a club. We just become people who don't engage with society. We never want to hijack a political cause with the gospel because that also gets weird. But we want to be inspired by the gospel we have and be obedient to what God wants for our lives, for our church. What are the needs here in Burbank? What are the needs here in LA? And if God is directing us to do projects, let's do it. If there's a cause that we need to be raising money for or awareness for, let's do it. And the history of CFTN is we've been a missions church. We've been a church that's been helping Christians across the country, and we want to continue to do that as we continue to regroup and rebuild during this next season. Pray and don't give up. Pray and don't give up. I am inspired by everyone's faith here. There was multiple moments in the life of CFTN, especially during the pandemic, where you guys could have given up. But you didn't. You lost your building. Your senior pastor was about to retire. You didn't have uh, a secure budget. And there was a big unknown. Yet, you kept praying and not giving up. Let's continue to pray and not give up. Let's pray and not give up when things are going bad. Let's pray and not give up when things are going good. Let's pray and not give up in easy seasons, difficult seasons, and all seasons. Let's pray and not give up because if God is for us, who could be against us? If God is for you, who could be against you? Pray, be persistent, don't lose your heart, and never give up. We've been praying for Rocky. Uh, Andrea's and Mart Martin's, that their grandkid. He uh, was born premature. And there was multiple times there could have been the moment to give up and stop praying. A pivotal moment happened when I was doing spiritual disciplines and talking about the power of fasting and praying. And guess what? Janet took the lead, and the people in the Bible study said, let's pray and fast because news was given by a doctor that things were not looking good. He was in the NICU most of his life. Last week, he went to a regular room, and if things are going as they are, this coming week, he's going home. Right. Praying, fasting, not giving up. That's our church. We pray and don't give up. What a beautiful name, Rocky. Rocky's franchise is one of my favorite movies. Uh, Rocky IV, specifically, where he takes down the Soviet Union. Uh, but but the, the line, uh, going in one more round when you don't think you can, that's what makes all the difference in your life. All things that are difficult are also the things that are most rewarding. You guys know this from experience. Usually, the things God wants you to do, Satan's going to get in your way because he doesn't want that to happen. We can't give up. We've got to pray and not give up. We have to be persistent like that widow. We have to persevere and not give up. Pray and don't give up. Another way to talk about giving up is what's your grit? What's your willpower? And we're Christians. You could have people with strong grit, good willpower, um, but there's no God in the picture. That's bad. I'm not saying don't give up. I'm saying pray and don't give up. I'm not saying pray and don't do anything. The Bible says pray and don't give up. So what does prayer look like without any grit, without any willpower, without any uh, fortitude on our end? What does it lead to? It leads to a passive Christianity when people are just praying and not doing anything. 
It could also lead to avoiding responsibilities. Someone may come up to you asking for help, and you just say, I'll, I'll pray about it, when you have the resources and the time to actually help the person there and then, to be the answer to the prayer. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, we don't want to have cheap grace. We want to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. We want to be people who pray and do things. Because prayer should empower us with God's spirit to do what he wants us to do. The prayer empowers us to step up, to pray like it depends on God, to work like it depends on us. Sometimes when people just pray and don't do anything, it leads to a weird hyper-spiritual church. Uh, there's this phrase called spiritual deflection. And instead of tell, uh, saying what your problem is, you just spiritualize it. So say, I don't know, uh, God forbid, like this analogy, like your husband is uh, uh, beating you up, abusing you. And the wife comes to you, and instead of saying, my husband is committing this sin, they're saying, I'm just in this trial, and they just spiritualize it without calling the sin for what it is. This happens a lot in Christian circles, but we want to make sure when we pray, we're able to pray in specifics, not just keep it in the ether, not just keep it uh, without calling things for what they are. We want to be people who pray, but also are speaking the truth and doing things. Because when we're honest, when we're doing things, prayer and the church start changing the world. However, if we just have willpower and we're doing things without prayer, we could be completely lost. Uh, there's this cartoon, The Ladder of Success. What does the guy say? Wrong wall. <laughs> Imagine you think you made it, and then you realize you're not standing on the wrong building. You made the height of the wrong ladder. Prayer makes sure we're climbing the right ladder. When we pray and not give up, we allow God to use us. When we pray, we let God help us in the process of what he wants us to do. When we pray and not give up, we are making sure we're going in the right direction. If you look at the um, Gospels and you look in uh, the Acts, uh, Paul gets a message, go left. Okay, I need to go this way, so he goes this way. I need to go here, so he goes here. Prayer gives us the direction we need. Um, some people have a lot of willpower, but they're serving the wrong cause. They're not serving God's purposes. And they're using their strengths and their giftings to serve someone else, not God. But prayer makes sure that we are aligned with God and doing what he wants versus just doing whatever we want. And prayer helps us become who we're supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, when we pray and do the will of God, we let God change us. We don't change God. We allow God in the process of becoming more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, so what happens in those moments when you prayed and never given up and things don't go according to plan? Anyone been there? Yes. Pray for a loved one, expecting the healing to come and it doesn't happen. Uh, you pray for a job and you're still looking for one. You pray for something. You pray for a spouse and they're still not available. Pray and you feel discouraged and you feel like, God, are you really good? Are you really loving? What is going on? I often find that God knows something that we don't, but we need to be persistent and still pray and not give up. Sometimes God may be protecting you without you realizing it. I just gave the story of liking the wrong girl and looking back, God was protecting me. At the time, it didn't feel like it. Sometimes it's all about God's timing. Sometimes you have to work on yourself before you're ready. Whatever it may be, the specific job, the specific call you have, God may say, not yet. I need to, to develop you more. I need to have you grow more and more as a person. Sometimes we are thinking we're doing God's will, but God really wants us to do something else. He doesn't want us to follow the trends of what other churches are doing because the other churches are doing those things. He wants us to do something 
that he alone wants us to do. He wants CFTN to do something that is different than any other cookie cutter, non-denominational church. Sometimes when God says no or doesn't speak, we have to always remind ourselves of the eternal perspective. We have to remind ourselves that death is part of life and remind ourselves that Jesus died so that we could live. That even though we will die one day, we will rise. One of the greatest miracles in the scriptures is Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Pretty amazing miracle after four days. But guess what? Lazarus still died. Sometimes we need to have a theology of the cross, the theology of sin and Satan. These are all forces that we are dealing with. But we have to say the Nineke Amen. We are victorious. Even in the midst of death itself, we belong to God. Nothing could separate us from the love of God our Father. Nothing. Not hell. Not heaven. Nothing in this world can separate us from the resurrection and the love of Jesus Christ. We need to have an eternal perspective when things don't go our way. So, we also need to finish well. Paul is passing the torch to his uh, mentee, Timothy, saying, continue the work, keep preaching, in season, out of season, do the work of an evangelist, don't give up, be patient, be kind, don't give up, keep at it, keep praying, keep at it. And then he's saying his final words. For I'm ready being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also, and to also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do you long for that day where just like you ran your race and you're going to be with God for eternity? Where he's going to say, well done, good faith, good and faithful servant. But in the meantime of getting there, I'm going to still run. Even though I might have hit my wall, I'm going to pray for that second wind to keep going. Even though things are getting even more tiresome and troubling, I'm still going to pray and not give up. I'm going to keep fighting one more round. I'm going to keep running one more mile knowing that God is with us and his church is with us. We need to be persistent and enjoy each day we have and be grateful for it. Because we're still around, that means there's work to do. That means there needs to be some prayers that need to get answered. There needs to be change that still needs to happen. God still wants to work in us and transform us from the inward out. He who began a good work will carry it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let us pray and not give up. Therefore, since we've been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You think Jesus wanted to give up? We're about to approach Holy Week. We're going to have a Monday Thursday service. Every week when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus was praying and asking, God, if there's another way to take this cup from me, if there's another way to bring about the salvation, please, now is the time. But he knew that this was the way. And he knew this is what he needed to do for us so that we could be saved. And he had the joy set before him, knowing the on the other side of the cross is the resurrection, is the new earth, new heaven. On the other side of the cross is our spiritual adoption. On the other side of the cross is the plans that God had for us before the foundations of the world. Look to the Lamb of God who was, who was there before this, who was slain before the foundation of the world, as Revelation says. And Jesus kept praying throughout his life. And on the cross, as he stood there, dying for our sins, he says, Father, 
Into your hand I commit my spirit, and it's done. It's finished. It's accomplished. Finito. I ran the race. This is the finish line. And he gave up his spirit. But three days later, he rose from the grave in a new body, completing God's plans for us. Dying so death could die. Rising so love can win. And when we accept him as Lord of our lives, we belong to him. He not only saves us, but leads us. And when we pray, we know where he's leading us. And when we don't give up our courage and don't lose heart, we keep going when there's this, the meandering along the journey, when there's roadblocks, where there's difficulties. We don't give up because Christ never gave up. We don't give up because we know God loves us and is for us. We don't give up because he cares about us. So church, let us pick up our cross and follow Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when things are going good, keep praying, don't give up. When things are awful, keep praying, and don't give up. When things are okay, keep praying, and don't give up. And when we are struggling on the journey, let us lift each other up to remind one another, let us pray and never give up because God is with us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to invite us to the Lord's table. This is our weekly reminder that Jesus Christ did it for us. He's victorious. And he's wanting to break bread with us today. If you're a Christian, welcome to this table. If you're not, please don't partake. On the night of his betrayal, after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is the blood, this is the body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the blood shed for the remission of sins. For whenever you take and eat, for whenever you take and drink, you proclaim our Lord's saving death until he returns. I'd like to invite the communion servers and the band up, and please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for finishing your job here and bringing about our salvation. As we come to your throne right now, as we come to take the bread and drink the wine, help us endure through whatever season we have. We thank you for the grace there is, the forgiveness there is, because of the sacrifice. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. So Lord, if anyone here is in a difficult season right now, speak to them, lift them up. Guide them, comfort them. Give them the justice they need, your peace that only you could give. Lord, we pray that you're with us as a church. Help us do what you want us to do. Let us not devise plans that we think are not of you and think we'll do great. We can't do anything great apart from you. So Lord, if there's anyone we need to forgive, help us forgive them as we come to this table. If there's anything we need to confess, help us give it to you right now. And give us your peace, your joy, your truth, your love. Because of the sacrifice, we are forgiven in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Welcome, church, to his table.